This episode of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Patreon supporters and listeners like you. If you enjoy Hellbent for Horror, please consider supporting the show by contributing either on our Patreon site or via PayPal. You can find links to both of those on hellbentforhorror.com. And I thank you for helping to sustain the show. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. We all have our guilty pleasures. And back in the early 1980s, Fangoria magazine was my Bible for guilty pleasures. Fangoria focused on contemporary horror movies and broke new ground by reveling in gore. In the early days, they wrote articles about horror and splatter and grindhouse and exploitation. Compared to famous monsters in Starlog magazine, Fangoria was a shocking and seedy affair. Looking back on it now, it makes perfect sense that the first time I ever heard of John Waters was in the August 1982 issue of Fangoria magazine. The name of the article was John Waters, Consummate Artist or Ultimate Sleaze, You Be the Judge. There was a picture of Waters in a suit and sporting his pencil-thin mustache. I didn't know anything about him, but when I saw that picture, I thought, Sleaze. The article was written by editor Robert Uncle Bob Martin using the pseudonym Brick Thornshaw. Now, Brick Thornshaw was a manly man. He wrote very manly articles on pro wrestlers and Mexican horror wrestling movies. Brick was, hilariously, the sports columnist for a horror magazine. So it was a brilliantly perverse idea to have Brick interview John Waters. The article starts like this. Filmmaking, that grand art that we all love, is becoming a toilet. Violence and degradation, bad film stock and perversion. Men who aren't really men, women who aren't really women. To Thornshaw, everything about Waters was un-American, including his distaste for sports. Waters didn't see the point of football if they wore helmets for protection. The only American value that John Waters seemed to support was violence. Thornshaw accuses Waters of scouring loony bins and dive bars for his actors, and to prove the point, there's a picture of a typical Hollywood cast and crew, and then a picture of the cast of a John Waters movie. The John Waters cast looks like a bunch of scary drug addicts and fat ladies from the circus. And then the interview gets contentious. Thornshaw demands that Waters defend having a 350-pound drag queen named Divine eat dog shit for his movie Pink Flamingos. Come again? Did I read that right? Uh, Surely that's a joke. The interview ends with Brick Thornshaw threatening to throw Waters out a window and ends with these words. John Waters constitutes a real and present danger, not just to the film industry, but to our entire American way of life. He deals in depravity and takes pride in it. He doesn't like sports, and he makes movies. John Waters must be stopped. My teenage mind was boggled. Who was this guy that could even repulse the writers of Fangoria magazine? Now, bear in mind that at that time, splatter films were considered depraved and immoral and obscene. Hey, we were supposed to be the new low in cinema history. There was a sidebar article called The Cinema Crimes of John Waters, and it listed the offenses in each film as if it were a police blotter. This film contains egg worship, sex with dead chickens, and the eating of dog feces. For the film Multiple Maniacs, it simply said, Divine is raped by a lobster. What the hell does that even mean? And what the hell is egg worship or shrimping? I spent the next decade finding out one John Waters movie at a time. When I first read that article back in 1982, I felt a sense of dread and the forbidden. This seemed like real stuff. These were the urban legends and fables that my parents believed about the hippies and the drug addicts downtown, but even worse, these long-haired, filthy-looking people sneered at the camera with guns in their hands. 
They were threatening to everything I knew. And Fangoria magazine seemed to be on the verge of hysteria over this new kind of horror. However, at the same time, Film Comment magazine was calling John Waters' movies the most outrageous comedies ever made. Which is it? Horror or comedy? You could say both, but the best answer is neither. Movies like these show how limited and pointless labels are. They are, quite simply, John Waters' films. It's hard to realize today just how insane and original early John Waters' films were. And it's not only because these days John Waters is best known for his mainstream movie Hairspray and the hit Broadway show that was based on it, but it's also because so many of the ideas that were once transgressive are now mainstream. RuPaul's Drag Race is mainstream, and true crime documentaries are mainstream. The shocks and the stunts of Jackass are mainstream, and the taboo-jabbing humor of South Park is mainstream. Hell, even blue and red colored punk hairstyles are mainstream. Back when Pink Flamingos was made, the actors had to break open magic markers to color their hair because there were no hair dyes like that. Punk was still four years away. All of those anarchic visions were introduced in early John Waters films, and unsuspecting and unprepared audiences got introduced to them all at once. Zero to 60 with no breaks. And that was just the tip of the iceberg what you were going to see. It's not a surprise that some film critics and audiences saw Pink Flamingos as a horror film, while others saw it as a comedy. Because horror and comedy do have some similarities. They both try to surprise the audience, to force them to have a physical reaction. They want to make you laugh, or they want to make you scream against your will. And to do that, both comedy and horror create tension. And then they ratchet that tension up as far as they can go, and then they break the tension with a punchline or a scare. And revered films like Evil Dead 2 and American Werewolf in London blur the line between comedy and horror. But John Waters' movies like Multiple Maniacs and Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble and Desperate Living are in their own category. These movies were made to shock jaded audiences that believed they had seen it all by 1970. John Waters set out to shock the unshockable. So, he played hardball with the sexual anxieties and the social tensions and the political tensions of the time. And the results were like 90-minute Rorschach tests. Do you laugh out loud or do you gag in horror? Or both? Variety called Pink Flamingos one of the most vile, stupid, and repulsive films ever made. The Village Voice called Desperate Living a triumphant example of the most vital bad taste in America. Comedy or horror? The answer depends on what audience is watching at the time. John Waters famously said, To me, bad taste is what entertainment is all about. If someone vomits during my movies, it's like a standing ovation. He also said, I hate message movies and I pride myself on the fact that my work has no socially redeeming value. I've never heard anyone accuse Waters of being preachy. Perverted and disturbed and obscene, that's another story. Just the sight of his leading lady in his early films caused a few nervous breakdowns. In the early 1970s, nobody had ever seen anything quite like Divine. For those who don't know, Divine was a character played by the late Harris Glenn Milstead. For lack of a better term to describe Divine to the uninitiated, I'll use drag queen here. But no drag queen looked anything remotely like Divine. Back then, drag queens wanted to look like Miss America contestants or pass as natural women. But Divine wasn't out to blend in. Divine was, as John Waters said, a fashion terrorist. Divine squeezed into skin-tight, garish cocktail dresses, even though she was over 300 pounds. Her head was shaved back to the crown, so the huge, creepy Clarabelle the Clown eye makeup could fit. Divine was six foot two without heels and close to seven feet tall with them. Divine scared the shit out of drag queens. Divine scared the shit out of everybody. Now, it's no surprise that this character alone would horrify Nixon's great silent majority. Divine's mere existence mocked gender conventions and body image and the facades of makeup and fashion, even the way women were supposed to act in proper society. 
But John Waters' films also mocked the peace and love flower power movement and how everything, including what you ate or wore, was a political statement. In these movies, Divine was a spree murderer who committed acts of extreme violence. There are multiple acts of cannibalism, execution-style shootings, castration, many deaths by stabbing, forced heroin injections, forced artificial insemination, strangulation, people held hostage in cages and basement dungeons, torture, amputation, disfigurement by acid, and multiple rapes with one of them, yes, committed by a giant lobster. This ain't the summer of love. Who in their right mind would make movies that tried to piss everybody off? Ah, but I think that's the twisted genius of these films. The sheer outrageousness of the bad taste is a great equalizer. The only line of delineation is your own gag reflex and your own sensibilities. John Waters is an equal opportunity offender. And because of that, John Waters fans cut across all party lines and age groups and sexual orientations and income levels. Hey, I don't hold it against anyone if they hate these movies. You either love them or you don't because you're never going to warm up to them. Like I said, we all have guilty pleasures. Every horror fan has that cheesy movie that we watch again and again and even recommend to select friends. We don't watch them because we like bad movies. We love them because we see the sincerity beneath the low budgets and the ineptitude. We know that the only bad movies are boring movies. I call this phenomenon the sincere pumpkin patch effect. I say all this because, given the guy I am, I shouldn't like the early films of John Waters. Really bad sound and production values drive me crazy. And Waters' early movies, especially Mondo Trasho, suffer from production challenges. So, why do I make an exception for these movies? Because John Waters has the most sincere pumpkin patch of them all. There's such total commitment to the crazy universe he creates, even the cheapness feels like part of the style. And John Waters offers no apologies. That crazy universe is a culmination of all John Waters' obsessions since he was a kid. He never got rid of any of his toys, and now they're all on the screen. He was reading Variety at the age of 12, so he was movie business savvy. As a teenager, he'd sneak into Ingmar Bergman films and Russ Meyer films on the same day. He was so obsessed with true crime and the tough girls at school that he made index trading cards on all the juvenile delinquents in school with fake backstories. He loved William Castle's B-movie horror movies and his carny showmanship. Even as a child puppeteer, Waters emulated William Castle. When he started using fake blood in his puppet shows, the parents stopped booking him. Waters' influences also include the godfather of gore, Herschel Gordon Lewis. His movie Multiple Maniacs is named as an homage to Lewis's 2000 Maniacs. A lot of the violence in Waters' movies is done with the look and the quality of H.G. Lewis movies. There's an eyeball stomp and desperate living that would feel right at home in Wizard of Gore. Add to that Russ Meyer's Tough Girl Killers and Douglas Sirk's Melodramas. Oh, and the evil queen from Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And you got John Waters. John Waters is also a student of the underground movies of Warhol and Jack Smith and the Kuchar brothers. The Kuchar brothers made their movies like Sins of the Fleshapoids in their apartment. That home movies as art aesthetic was all the permission Waters needed to hatch a plan. All he needed were a few co-conspirators. Divine brought her hairstylist friend David Lockery, who was game for anything. Mary Vivian Pierce and Susan Lowe and Ming Stoll were friends of Waters, and they were on board from the start. Cookie Mueller was a real-life vagabond hippie tough girl right out of a Russ Meyer film. Edith Massey was a barmaid at Pete's Hotel in Baltimore. She was obese and snaggletooth and had a whiny voice and was a total sweetheart. Waters asked her if she wanted to be in a movie, and she said, Sure, hon. Van Smith shared Waters' vision to make Ugly Beautiful, and they worked together on the makeup and the costumes that would help create Divine. Vincent Peranio shared Waters' love of kitsch, that moment when trendy styles go haywire. Vince had carpentry skills, so he became the set designer. These people shared the same crazy sense of humor as Waters. These people were all eccentrics who wanted to break out of the mundane, and there was not one fuck to be given amongst them all. And with that, the Dreamlanders were born. 
The first John Waters movie I saw was Multiple Maniacs, which is a great mix of his true crime, horror, and camp inspirations. It's also a good example of how genre labels fail you. If you look on the Internet Movie Database, Multiple Maniacs is listed under Crime Film. I'm just thinking of some guy who's just finished streaming Truman Capote's In Cold Blood or Zodiac, and he goes, Oh, Multiple Maniacs. Let's try this out. John Waters wanted to scare street society, and Divine was going to be their monster. Divine was the King Kong and Godzilla of drag queens. John Waters said that Divine's final rampage in Multiple Maniacs is supposed to remind you of Godzilla, and that's why he has the National Guard come after her. The story follows Lady Divine and her cavalcade of perversion, a traveling group of outlaws. This cavalcade is reminiscent of Kroger Babs' 40 Thieves, who travel with tents to show exploitation movies during the days of the Hayes Code. Like Kroger Bab, Lady Divine has a tent on the outskirts of town, and the proper folks come out to see the obscene and illegal acts they've only read about in the newspapers. Lady Divine does something Kroger Bab probably wished he could do. The audience is robbed at the end of the show. Later on, Lady Divine just murders them, which is bad for repeat business. From the very beginning, we see the sly wit of Waters and just how repressed the times were. All you need to do is see what was considered a perversion in the cavalcade. These were things regular people were terrified of. Come see two actual queers kissing each other on the lips. Actual queers, ladies and gentlemen. See a heroin addict go through cold turkey. Watch him lose all dignity and decency. And then there's the woman licking a bicycle seat to the repulsion of the audience. And a naked woman allows a man to take pictures of her precious reproductive organs while she swills down some wine. And of course, there's the puke eater. You can't forget the puke eater. Now, these perversions are either quaint these days or just plain absurd. But there's an atom bomb waiting for the audience, a scene that still raises hackles today. Divine gets a rosary job in a church pew while we watch a reenactment of the Catholic Stations of the Cross. What's a rosary job, you may ask? It's when someone inserts rosary beads up your ass while you recite the Stations of the Cross. That must be illegal, right? Well, the head of the Maryland Censor Board, Mary Evera, certainly thought it was. She took Waters to court. The judge said, my eyes were assaulted for 90 minutes, but there's nothing illegal here. Why not, you may ask? Well, first, you don't see anything explicit. It's all implied. And second, because rosary jobs don't exist. Like many sexual acts in Waters' films, it was made up just to be as tasteless as possible. All that existed was a dirty, dirty thought, a joke. With John Waters, one man's comedy is another man's horror movie. So what did I see when I watched Multiple Maniacs for the first time? In my late teens, I was in full rebellion mode from a repressed fundamentalist upbringing. I was a metalhead and a gore hound and a shit stirrer. But... I may not have been as repressed as the audience at the cavalcade of perversion, but my religious upbringing still hid in the shadows. Deep down, I still had fears and prejudices. One of the fears was blasphemy. Not cartoon blasphemy, like I found in death metal, but a blasphemy that was so detailed it triggered my subconscious. In his book Shock Value, Waters talks about the difference between good bad taste and bad bad taste. It's easy to discuss someone. I could make a 90-minute picture of people getting their limbs hacked off, but that would only be bad, bad taste, not very stylish or original. To understand bad taste, one has to have very good taste. Good, bad taste can be creatively nauseating, but must, at the same time, appeal to the especially twisted sense of humor, which is anything but universal. Heavy metal bands yelling Hail Satan was done in bad, bad taste. It was an easy way to offend, and it was a simple shock. But this scene didn't just mock the execution of Jesus. It sexualized it. Or more accurately, it laid bare the creepy sexualizing of Jesus' near-naked body that the ritual of the Stations of the Cross suggests. This fetishizing of his body and his blood 
with women and men moaning in grief, but do some moan in ecstasy? What guilty fantasies have young women and men needed to stifle, confused as to why they are having these thoughts? During this ritual that fetishizes the body, it's the one time it's okay to covet. So as I watched Multiple Maniacs, I wasn't laughing. I was terrified that at any moment Armageddon would start, and here I was sitting watching this frickin' movie. But a funny thing happened, literally. Divine is raped by a 15-foot lobster, an act so insanely random and absurd that I belly laughed like there was no tomorrow, and the lobster even has a name, Lobstora. I laughed, and I wasn't struck down by lightning. And just like that, I matured, if that's the right word, just a little, through shock therapy. Multiple Maniacs was meant to make some laugh and horrify others, but shock everyone. This movie explores Waters' true crime fetish as well, especially his fixation with the Manson family. There's a line in the movie that suggests Divine's boyfriend was an accomplice to the Sharon Tate murder. When this movie came out in 1970, the Manson family weren't yet identified as the killers, so in the public's mind, the killers were still on the loose. The idea of killer hippies was just becoming a reality. No wonder the Dreamlanders scared some people. No wonder some people thought they were like the characters they played. John Waters has said that Pink Flamingos was the first Blair Witch Project. It took place in the woods, it looked like a whole movie, and everybody thought it was real. For years, Waters and Divine would be asked in interviews where their family was living now that they burned down their trailer. They assumed that Divine dressed and acted like that all the time. In fact, because of the look and feel of Pink Flamingos, interviewers and audiences thought the actors were just playing themselves in the movie. When you realize how insane the action is in Pink Flamingos, that assumption sounds hilariously wrongheaded. And yet, as you watch it, you may find yourself wondering where the line between the character and the actor really is. The Internet Movie Database classifies Pink Flamingos as a comedy-slash-crime-slash-horror movie. It is John Waters' most famous and infamous movie. The story follows Divine and her family of criminals as they live in hiding under assumed identities in rural Baltimore. Divine goes by the name Babs Johnson, and she lives in a trailer in the woods with her mother Edie, her son Crackers, and his girlfriend Cotton. Sounds inconspicuous enough, right? Except that the only thing Divine changes is her name, so she is in full regalia. And Mama Edie is an obese senior citizen in a crib dressed only in panties and a bra. And she has a profound obsession for eggs. And Crackers is an insane hippie who has a fetish for chickens and his own mother. And Cotton, well, Cotton loves to watch. Despite all of this, they're somehow living in peaceful anonymity until a local tabloid names Divine the filthiest person alive. This draws the ire of Connie and Raymond Marble, a slimy local couple that kidnap runaways and impregnates them in their basement dungeon. Then they sell the babies to lesbian couples and then use the proceeds to finance heroin suppliers for elementary schools. Hey, with all the hard work they do, they want to be the filthiest people alive. It's good to have goals. The rest of the movie is a war between the two factions trying to outfilth each other. The movie gets more bizarre and gross and outrageous as it goes along. And I'll bet that even if you've never seen Pink Flamingos, you know it's ending. Just in case, spoiler alert, although I don't think it matters. Divine eats dog shit. For real, in one unbroken shot. Waters knew people would still have a hard time believing it happened even without any cuts. Now that I've said that, let me say that it's probably the most good-natured of his early films. This doesn't have the Douglas Sirk melodrama and the Sturm and Drong that's in the other ones. This movie is a joyous and gleeful celebration of being a freak and being proud of it. The difference between the good guys and the bad guys is whether they can accept who they are and accept others for who they are. In Waters' films, the only real beauty is self-confidence and self-reliance. 
Outside of Hairspray, these may be the happiest characters in any John Waters film. Like the Eggman, who delivers to Mama Edie, he's so happy to do his job, he could be the creepy brother of Mr. McFeely from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Speedy delivery indeed. Divine's family even has a bunch of friends who come to celebrate her birthday. And when one of the guests entertains the crowd by spreading his ass cheeks and singing Surfing Bird by gaping his asshole open, everyone takes it as the happy gift it was intended to be. And what's fascinating is that Pink Flamingos is easily the movie that has the most grotesque and extreme and unsettling and offensive ideas out of any of his movies. A live chicken gets its head cut off and is crushed between two people having sex in a scene that even Waters admits is too much for him these days. And then, of course, there's the finale. And I admit my eyes teared up and I gagged the first time I saw the finale. It was a shit-eating grin that did me in. And yet, this film is his biggest hit outside of Hairspray, and it launched his career. You might say it was because of the dog shit, but I think the dog shit got people in the door initially, but the repeat viewings and cult popularity are because of how joyful this entire horror show is. Compare the cannibalism scene that ends Divine's birthday party with the cannibalism scenes in Multiple Maniacs and Desperate Living. There's a whole different tone. There's a whole different energy. Waters made a movie so sunny in its disposition that we laughed at the atrocities. In the late 1980s, I was a crash firefighter in the United States Air Force. The guys at the station and myself prided ourselves as cocky and unshockable. We were on 24-hour shifts, and since we were stuck in the station, we'd send someone to get videos for us to watch. Since I was the horror guy, they challenged me to get a movie that would gross them out. I get to the video store, and I pick up a copy of Pieces and Gates of Hell. And then I see a copy of Pink Flamingos. Now, a lot of these guys were from the Midwest, never left the farm until they enlisted. These were salt-of-the-earth guys, and I needed to take those sensibilities into consideration. So of course I brought Pink Flamingos back for them to watch. They were bored to death with pieces and gates of hell. And then I put on Pink Flamingos. The first sign of concern was immediate. As soon as they saw Edie in her crib yelling, Babs, Babs, why isn't the Eggman here? Everyone in the TV room turned to look at me. And then Divine comes in and sits on the couch next to Edie's crib. What the fuck? Some of the farm boys from the Midwest get up and leave fast. But everyone else starts laughing and shaking their heads. They have no idea what they're watching, and they have no idea what to think. But they keep watching. It had their attention. They laugh hard as Divine walks down a crowded street to the song, The Girl Can't Help It. They crack up when Raymond Marble flashes girls in a park with a kielbasa tied to his dick. But it was a later flashing scene that let me know the movie completely won them over. A beautiful woman sits alone in a gazebo and Raymond does his dick flash, this time with a turkey neck tied to it. The woman laughs at him and flashes her tits. Raymond is confused that she doesn't run. And then the beautiful woman pulls up her dress and shows him her pre-op dick. The guys in the TV room erupt into huge belly laughs. It is safe to say Pink Flamingos won over a hostile crowd, and I got a new reputation. John Waters and Divine would make one more cult movie together, and it's my favorite John Waters film, Female Trouble, or, as I like to call it, a much cheaper and much more coherent Natural Born Killers. Waters often used the artificiality of beauty standards and the conformity it breeds to comment on how the status quo creates people who are obsessed with artifice. And, in female trouble, the most dangerous artifice is celebrity, and it corrupts everyone. Waters uses his obsessions around true crime and bad girls and his perspective on beauty and his love for cheesy melodramas to predict our current culture of celebrity. We are introduced to Don Davenport, a teenager who is bad to the bone and is a slave to bad girl skanky fashion. When Dawn's parents don't get her a pair of cha-cha heels for Christmas because nice girls don't wear cha-cha heels, she pushes the tree on top of her mother and runs away. 
Our story follows Dawn through a parody of melodramas right out of Mildred Pierce. In one of my favorite scenes in any movie, Dawn has sex with a stranger on the side of the road, and Divine plays both characters. One is Dawn, the other is the man. Dawn has a child and becomes a single parent, and she needs to make cash. Now, normally, this is the part of the story where the bad girl turns to crime, and she does. But in this crazy universe, beauty and fashion are stand-ins for the thug's life, or show business. The world of Dawn's parents was as square as square can be, but the world of beauticians is topsy-turvy and family and social values are reversed. In this movie, the mother of a street beautician tries to set her son up with gay men because the world of the heterosexual is a sick and boring life. This flip on values lets Waters play out the smartest and most anarchic idea in any of his films. Dawn is discovered by Donna and Donald Dasher, two high-fashion hipsters who own a very exclusive boutique that they populate with their stars. They are nouveau riche, high-fashion trendsetters, and they believe that crime is beauty. And they believe that crime fashion is the next big thing. They know a bad girl when they see one, and they want to make Dawn their experiment. Now, fame and fashion and crime are Dawn's addictions. And once she gets a taste for them, she'll do anything to keep them. And what follows is an ingenious comment on how we glamorize killers and criminals in pop culture and how the manufacture of hype turns them into celebrities for doing nothing more than doing horrible things. When you watch Divine stop in mid-kill to strike poses for a photographer right before she smashes the victim's head in with a chair or cuts off a hand with an axe, and then... She thanks the members of the Academy from her seat on the electric chair. You have witnessed genius. Of course, the irony isn't lost on me that this film is dedicated to Tex Watson. And Pink Flamingos is dedicated to Susan Atkins, Patricia Kernwinkle, and Leslie Van Houten, the Manson family girls. The shadow of the Manson family is the one thing that troubles me about these films. With the characters of the Dashers in Female Trouble, it feels like Waters could sense that his brand of outrageousness was going to be co-opted by mainstream popular culture. Unfortunately, pop culture turns good bad taste into bad bad taste by keeping the shock but forgetting the wit. Later generations have created cults around Charles Manson, turning him into a hero in utmost seriousness. Waters says he's thoroughly uninterested in Manson himself. It's the Manson family members that he was obsessed with. He was fascinated about how kids his age, from his social background, could be convinced to leave their normal lives behind and go live on a ranch and form an anarchistic family, and how they could be mesmerized by the influence of drugs and a charismatic leader who thought up crazy theories and crazy adventures. And then that charismatic leader convinced them to commit the atrocities. Yeah, you caught the irony there, right? I'm happy I experienced the cinema crimes of John Waters, and if this episode gets one innocent person to follow me into the cavalcade of perversion, I'll be a happy accomplice. Come for the lobster rape. Stay for the singing asshole. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lee Sigorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. You can find Hellbent for Horror on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And H4H has its own app. You can download it from the Google or Amazon store for Android, and as of the week of March 20th, it will be available on the iTunes store. Until next time, stay hell-bent.